What's cracking, big new house? This is a very, <clears throat> very, very important video. It's a very important piece of content because everything we have done for the last five months has led up to this particular piece of content, okay? This is going to be a general draft strategy video. We have our E-Town Get Down draft tonight. No, we will not be live streaming it. Maybe I'll pop on for like 30 minutes or something on YouTube. Make sure you got the notifications turned on for the channel because it's going to be a little slip and slide action. I'm going to slide in. I'm going to slide out like Zendaya's DMs. And just like her, I'm sure you will answer them. But the vlog, the full vlog for the E-Town Get Down draft will be posted Thursday morning. So we're going to get you riled up for NFL kickoff games are bike we are bike we're in the headquarters i don't remember how i started this video so if i didn't introduce myself i'm nicholas that's bdge big dogs gotta eat fantasy football and we are reporting live from the headquarters a lot of y'all probably have your final drafts tonight maybe you have one tomorrow so hopefully this video can still help you out there is very 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 little draft content to continue doing so this will be the final piece of it tomorrow i will get into bold predictions i'm gonna make five i've made a few bold predictions over the course of the summer but now that everything is wrapped up we got the depth charts we got the rosters we got the rookies we got the guys who got chopped up and cut sliced down we've got the big picture here so i want to go on record with a few bold predictions before the season starts so i could either look like an idiot or i could look like a genius probably the former but i want them on record and that will be tomorrow's video so i'm still trying to work out some of the kinks of how we're going to do in-season content and i'm trying to figure out a way for us to still do like five to six pieces of content a week obviously we will be putting that out completely free on youtube if any of you guys have supported us through the off season via the draft guide i want to give you a, like a huge 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 sincere thank you from the bottom of my black heart for real we worked very 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 hard on that and for you guys to use your hard-earned money on something that we have created that we've put our energy and time and investment into it means a lot to me i know it's just a simple purchase for you guys but just the support that you guys have shown over this summer especially during times when people don't have a lot to give man it, it is uh it, it is humbling but i i love y'all for that for real and um <clears throat> And if you have not yet copped the draft guide and you have a draft coming up tonight or tomorrow or Wednesday or whenever that may be the case, the easiest way to do it is via our sponsor, monkeyknifefight.com. They are sponsoring the draft guide, which has literally everything. It's a one-stop shop preparation piece for your fantasy football draft. Head over to monkeyknifefight.com deposit ten dollars on their website use the promo code bdge when you do so and we're going to win a lot of money on monkey knife fight because their player games their player prop games are starting up this week we're going to turn some of that deposit money you know the money that y'all deposited for the draft guide guess what that's real money that you paid for so you not only got the draft guide for it but now we get to use it to exponentiate and turn that shit into revenue i don't know if exponentiates a word but that's how excited i am to make sure that we pay the mortgage with the money that you invested into monkey knife fight so we will be doing our favorite monkey knife fight player prop games throughout the entirety of the season so that money that you threw in there you might have forgot about guess what we're gonna go run through that we're gonna put our thing down flip it and reverse it. We got our Missy Elliott shit on this Monday morning. Missy Elliott Monday is coming to a theater near you. Starting tomorrow, starting today, starting right now. Hit the goddamn intro. Not until I tuck my shirt in, though. Y'all thought you were gonna fucking catch me slipping? Nah, nah, not in the last draft. Nah, not in the last draft strategy video of the year. So tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. Now let's see. Within the Big Dogs draft guide, one of the pieces I write every summer is the Big Dogs Bible. And it is about 10,000 words going position by position, no matter what kind of league you're in. An overall strategy piece on the trends that we've seen, the player movements that we've seen, rookies, the upside picks, the floor players. Like every, every piece of strategy that we have seen come to fruition over the last five or six months, because we've been putting out content for about that long, about the 2020 fantasy season, I culminate into this one piece. And what I want to do is kind of break it down for you. This is like a light version of the Bible. And if you've unfortunately been watching me for you know the last couple months, then you probably know around what I'm going to say for the next 20 minutes or so. But for those of you that are new or for those of you that just want to 
quick smack in the arse to remember what I've been talking about. This is what I would do. And we talked about it a little bit in depth in last week's bunk bed breakdowns video draft strategy, right? I just want to give you my personal point of view because you guys have been fucking with me for a while and this is straight from the Hefe's mouth. Based on the way the NFL is set up right now, based on the way fantasy football is set up right now, we have a lot of workhorse running backs at our disposal. We don't have a lot of high-end elite wide receiver production coming out of almost anywhere right now in the NFL. And we could look at it in one of two ways. We could say last year was a bit fluky. And I do think statistically it was a very down year for wide receivers, especially high end ones. I've dropped this stat before, but Michael Thomas was the only wide receiver to go over 1400 receiving yards last year. That is tied for the lowest amount of single season, 1400 yard receivers over the last 25 years. On the flip side, 25 receivers had 1,000 or more receiving yards last year, which was the highest number of the last 25 years, tied with, I think, like 1999 or some shit. Point being is we're going into this year thinking, oh, wide receiver so deep, but we don't have a lot of high-end talent. Now, I think that is going to come down to the market level, where we do have more 1,400-yard receivers this year. The wide receiver two to three range, we're not going to have as many 1,000-yard receivers. And then next year, going into the drafts, we're going to be saying something like, Okay, well, wide receiver is not as deep. You still want to hammer them, but you want to get one or two good ones early. Something like that, right? The, the market always adjusts itself. The market is the market is the market and slaps you in the face every single year. That being said, the running back workhorse position is a real thing right now. We have an influx of really talented young running backs that are taking over the roles in their respective backfields. And these wide receivers are seeing the target distribution spread amongst the teams because as we're getting an influx of young running back talent, we're also getting an influx of young coaches who are new and who are fast paced and who are unique with their offensive schemes and ideas and the McVeighs and and these guys who are able to spread the ball around more. They look for the mismatches on the defensive side of the ball, right? You can take one player and just continue to feed him the ball over and over and over again, but how efficient is that going to make your offense? So we've seen a lot of these coaches like Cliff Kingsbury spread the ball out. When they're running, like the reason, one of the reasons we don't like DeAndre Hopkins this year, not only because he's moving over to a new team and he doesn't have as much practice time to to get involved with Kyler Murray and to you know, build that chemistry or whatever, just a buzzword to kind of fucking fill up time and space. I think it's more practical to look at it from the point of view that, Cliff Kingsbury runs a ton of four wide receiver sets, right? So the target distribution, whereas, you know, a lot of teams might run 12 personnel or a lot of teams might run with three wide receivers, right? There's always one fewer target on the field. But when you're running four wide receiver sets, two of them are slot, two of them are outside, one's a running back. You have just by default more targets out there, which means even with someone's elite talent like DeAndre Hopkins commanding targets, that's one fewer opportunity to get the ball looked at your way. The overall strategy point of view, what I'm trying to get across here is that the way the NFL is moving, they are a passing league, but this is involving running backs in a much higher quantity and volume and level. So wide receivers are just getting the ball spread around more. So I don't think we're going to continue to see like elite talent. I don't think we're going to see those 2000 yard seasons. You know, uh, obviously that's not a thing that we typically see, but high end level of running back strategy, the high end level of running back production that we see in the NFL, I don't think is going anywhere. And those are the guys that win you your fantasy leagues. And you could argue like, yes, the bus rates on running backs early on in drafts are higher than wide receivers. However, it doesn't matter because running backs are the ones that win you your league. Like I would rather take a chance. I would rather risk drafting running backs early knowing that there's a more or there's a higher likelihood of them busting but also basically giving you the only chance of winning your league than doing the vice versa like you don't want to play for fifth place you don't want to play for sixth place you're trying to play for first place second place or third place and something gets lucky and breaks right in the playoffs and you win your league case in point the entire argument i'm making here is that the value of replacement at the running back position is at such a ridiculous gap especially this year in fantasy when we have about 12 or 13 proven workhorses that you want to be hammering those guys early, okay? You want to come away with at least two running backs in the first three rounds. And for me, depending on your position, if you're at the 101, 102, 103, and you grab a C-Mac, a Sequan, Zeke, you're going to have trouble getting that on the back end, okay? But if you are anywhere from picks like 5 through 12 or 5 through 10, depending on your league size, you'll most likely be able to get two of the top 
13 running backs. Okay. So there's a tier break after I think like the Aaron Jones ish kind of section there. Okay. And you want to get two of the top 13, 14 running backs. Again, I go in much more depth on this stuff with more numbers, analytics, and you have my rankings within the guide and you've got my sleepers over value players, must draft players, guys I'm targeting. So I just want a brief overview of like the strategy I'm taking this year in most drafts and why I'm going about doing that. You hammer the running back position earlier on in the drafts, whether it's a combination of Josh Jacobs and Austin Eckler, or if it's Clyde Edwards Hilaire and Nick Chubb, or if it's, you know, Christian McCaffrey and Aaron Jones, something like that. I'm not the highest on Aaron Jones, but I think he does fall into that tier of that second tier ish running backs. The positional value is just so much higher at running back that you're going to be okay taking him, even if he does see kind of like a dip in production or snaps because AJ Dillon is in the picture. Now with wide receivers, it gets tricky earlier on because you, what happens is you kind of build yourself a hole. You take a Michael Thomas in the first round and then you take a Julio in the second round and guess what you get to the third fourth fifth sixth rounds and you're like fuck there's so many good wide receivers I want to keep stacking 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 before you know it you have four or five wide receivers on your team without a really good running back without two good running backs right you might get like a James Conner or Chris Carson in the third or fourth round surrounded by four wide receivers and then you get to the sixth round and you're like fuck there's still another really good wide receiver that I want on the board and you put yourself in a position where you've dug yourself into a hole and you can't really get out of it because you did not plan properly up front. So we do say be flexible in your drafts and I don't typically go into a draft thinking like I want this position and this position and then this position, right? But this year is a little bit different because I've, I've seen how everything has kind of taken shape and seen the trends throughout the summer that it makes sense that you want to grab those workhorse running backs and you want to grab them early and then you want to slam wide receivers in rounds three, four, five, six, seven. Not all. It doesn't have to be five wide receivers in a row, but your wide receiver core is going to be made up of those middle rounds of wide receivers. It's the Thielen, Allen Robinsons, DJ Moore's in the third round. And then in the fourth round, you can grab guys like Robert Woods, Tyler Lockett, DJ Chark, Terry McLaurin. And one of those guys might fall to the fifth round along with maybe a Calvin Ridley, maybe a Marquise Hollywood Brown. And then you can get like Tyler Boyd. The value is just so deep that, you know, you just dig yourself into a hole if you start hitting those guys early. And yeah, it's nice to have like a Michael Thomas or a Julio Jones in the beginning. But I'm telling you from a game theory, from a structure standpoint, you're going to like your team a lot less when you do set it up that way. The other way I'm thinking too is like you you grab your two running backs early and you don't want to put yourself in a mindset where you go, okay, I got my two running backs. I'm fading again until like the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th round. I think in those middle rounds, you do snag another running back, okay? Because you do want to start a running back in the flex spot. You might not give yourself the capability of doing so, and that's okay, but you want to give yourself a third running back that could potentially break out and be like a top 15 running back with upside. Okay. So the way I look at it is if I'm going to grab two running backs early, I'm not fading the running back for the rest of the draft. I want a third running back who is very, very, very high upside in those middle rounds. It's why I've been talking about guys like DeAndre Swift. It's why I've risen on a guy like Cam Akers with Darrell Henderson out of the picture for now. You know, he's got the hamstring injury. We don't know what his status is going to be for week one. Cam Akers has that workhorse upside running back. DeAndre Swift has a very, very high ceiling, despite what you guys want to say about the Lions. Swift injury, of course, is scaring me, right? And I think that's going to move him down board. So rather than having to take take Swift at the back of the fourth, the early fifth, you could probably wait till that six, seven turn. So you're not relying on him because you already have your two running backs up front. But when he does get on the field and when he does hit in weeks five or six, like guess what? Now you've got probably the deadliest trio of running backs in your starting lineup. So I absolutely want to stack the first two running backs that I had with a high upside play. Okay. I don't want a floor play. Like this is the reason I'm avoiding guys like a Le'Veon Bell, a David Johnson, those middle round guys, like it would have been a David Montgomery ish kind of situation, but he got hurt obviously i have no desire to grab a guy that doesn't have a ceiling at that level i'd rather take a wide receiver that has wide receiver one ceiling in his overall range of outcomes so when i get to the middle rounds those are where the running back picks get riskier right deandre swift of course i'm I'm acknowledging that it's absolutely a risk it could turn into running back by committee the injury could linger into the season and maybe he re-injures it i personally believe maybe you don't believe that swift's got this upside but i do so he's a guy i'll be targeting because i want that third running back i want that flex play to be ridiculously high upside because that's what will win you your league ultimately and stacked with those other wide receivers that you got in the middle round You've probably put together a team that has two strong running backs up front, high upside running back in the middle, and then you could probably grab another one in the in the ninth round, in the eighth round. Like you could probably get a James White or even like a Zach Moss, seventh, eighth, ninth round in that range, and you're going to feel pretty good about your running back four there because you could plug one of those guys in. Like I think one of the the better strategies right now, it, I, I think Zach Moss is probably a really good arbitrage play to DeAndre Swift. Like two rounds later, even though his ADP is probably shooting up 
draft boards. If you're in like a family friends league, Zach Moss is a guy who's probably going to go pretty far under the radar for most people. Like if you're not on fantasy Twitter all the time, want to make sure you're following me. I realize my social clip ain't up. Oh, Nicholas, what are we doing here? Nope. That ain't it. There we go. Make sure you are following me, not only on the Twitter, but on the gram. If you want to see the ignorant shit I do on the weekends. But as I was saying, if you're not on like fantasy Twitter, you know, you probably haven't been involved with the hype of Zach Moss. And you're probably remembering back to last year and thinking, oh, you know, Devin Singletary is in for a breakout year. That's not the case. The vibes over here are that Devin Singletary is going Zach Moss. They're a very similar player, both very shifty, very elusive. They're fun. They're guys you want to have on your team, but they're a little bit slow. They kind of lack explosion. Good in the passing game, except for Zach Moss is like 25 pounds heavier than Devin Singletary is. So he's probably got the upper hand. Devin Singletary has been dealing with a lot of fumbling issues, supposedly at camp and might lose a starting job straight up because of that issue. So Zach Moss, James White, I think like a James White is a perfect play to put into the lineup if you have DeAndre Swift, right? Because James White will give you RB2 numbers for three or four weeks. So he's just a staple of that offense. He's one of the few staples that are moving to this cam regime, right? They've got all these new playmakers outside of Julian Edelman, James White. Like those are their guys that are going in that they know are productive, that they trust in this offense. So you get a guy like James White in the eighth, ninth round, give you RB2 numbers in your flex spot, wait for DeAndre Swift to start giving you high-end RB2 numbers with low-end RB1 upside over the second half of the year and boom you are set at the running back position by this point you probably got three or four wide receivers we could talk about quarterback and the beginning of my must own quarterbacks video if you are in a super flex league or if you're you know just curious about my thoughts on quarterbacks overall i honestly at this point i don't know what the majority of my audience leagues play in i almost strictly play in super flex leagues which is basically your starting two quarterbacks drop a comment down below let me know what the majority of your leagues have turned into so i know around this this time of the year when i get a high number of views on my videos a lot of them are just like a new influx of of people doing research for the first time all summer which means that you guys are probably in less competitive leagues and i would assume still in the one quarterback majority league so drop a comment down below let me know what kind of league you're in are you in a league that only starts one quarterback or have you have i fucking suckered you into the two quarterback super flex lifestyle over here depending on which league you're in you're obviously going to attack quarterback very differently and in the must own quarterbacks video which i would suggest you go watch on my channel afterwards the overall gist of it was if you're in a one quarterback league we are obviously just going to do what everybody says. We're going to fade quarterback and later on in the draft. I will say, though, if you're in a tight position where you feel like you're reaching, if, if you had C-Mac at the 101 and you get back to the 212, 31, and you feel like you're reaching up a bunch of tiers to grab players that you don't necessarily like, I'm not going to hate taking Lamar Jackson there. Like a C-Mac, Lamar Jackson, Allen Robinson stack would be fine with me there. If Chris Godwin saw on the board, I would take him over uh, a guy like Lamar Jackson. Or if there's a running back that falls to you, like Austin Eckler, if he falls to you at the 212, absolutely smash it over Lamar Jackson. But this is probably the only situation in which I'd, I'd be okay grabbing Lamar. It's if you pick really early on in the first, and then when you get back to your pick in the second or third, and you feel like you're reaching up multiple tiers to get guys that you don't really like, you won't regret taking Lamar Jackson, okay? So Lamar Jackson is the only like early round quarterback that I'm semi okay with. Otherwise, you're you're fading until later on in the drafts. And you could just look at my rankings inside the draft guide to tell you which guys I like more than consensus, et cetera, et cetera. Speaking of rankings, in season, one thing I know that I will be doing in season, my weekly rankings, of course, engaging with y'all as Patreons. So if you're a Patreon member, patreon.com, forward slash B D G E. You will not only get access to uh, a weekly Q and a, so we do a weekly live stream that's available to the Patreon members. Uh, I do put it up on YouTube afterwards. It is, is free to watch afterwards, but if you want to be inside the live stream, the live chat with me, asking your questions, you know, sit star trade questions, whatever you got, waiver wire shits, then you'll have to become a Patreon member. And within being a Patreon member, you'll get our exclusive waiver wire uh, article that we put out each Monday and you will get my weekly rankings. I do not put my weekly rankings anywhere on the interwebs outside of Patreon. So if you need help with your sit star questions, you will get them via Patreon, patreon.com slash B D G. So with the quarterbacks, yes, I do one quarterback and I'll be okay taking Lamar. Otherwise, we are fading till later on in the drafts, except if those second tier quarterbacks, the Deshaun's Dak, Kyler, or Russell Wilson fall into like the seventh ish round. I'll slap whatever one of those guys falls the latest. That I'm okay with. In super flex leagues, though, I have I have echoed this pretty loudly. And the thing I'm echoing here is quantity over quality. Quantity over quality. Quantity over quality. Y'all hear that echo? Quantity over quality. In a redraft league for Superflex, you do not 
need to use a premium pick on a quarterback. You do not need to take one of them in the first round. Get your running backs, okay? If you go with quarterbacks, you're going to be in round seven or round eight and be like, fuck, like there's still quarterbacks on the board that can put me up 18 points per game. That's not going to be the case with running backs, okay? You can get like fill in players, like I mentioned with James White, and be okay with it, but those are not league winning players. You're missing out on league winning players at the running back position in the first and second round if you fade them for quarterbacks. So it's quantity over quality. If you're in a super flex league, grab three quarterbacks, but don't grab ones that are ranked super high. Don't grab ones that you're going to have to reach up for. Don't grab Josh Allen at quarterback seven in the third round. Okay. What you want to do is look at a list of rankings and decide where's the cutoff. Where is the cutoff of a guy that anyone ranked below him? I would not be comfortable starting in my lineup in a two quarterback league. Everyone ranked above him. I would be comfortable. So get that last valuable ranking, last viable ranking guy, right? You take that quarterback and you draft him. But you also make sure that you draft someone above him as well, okay? So if he's quarterback 18, you could draft the six, the quarterback 16 with him, the quarterback 13 with him, the quarterback 10 with him, whatever it is, then you'll have two quarterbacks that you're comfortable starting, but they don't need to be high end. There's no reason to waste the upper draft capital when the positional value is not there in a points per game basis. You are not getting league winning quarterbacks that late because there's no difference between the guy you draft in the seventh round and the guy you draft in the fifth round or the fourth round. I promise you, it just ain't there. So quarterbacks, wait in Superflex. But this is not me telling you like, okay, yeah, it's fine to draft just uh, Nick Foles and Mitch Trubisky and Justin Herbert and Tyrod Taylor. And you said quantity over quality, but yet, yes, yes, yes. There's a fucking cutoff to the quality though. Okay. There's a quality metric meter here and they don't fall into the pot. They don't fall into the cocktail. Understand what I'm saying. Tight end position. The tight end position is one that I will not be investing early capital into. I mean, we all like Travis Kelsey. We all like George Kittle. We like Mark Andrews. We like Zach Ertz. But again, they're just, I don't want to use early round capital outside of the running back position that you'll have to for Travis Kelsey or George Kittle. Mark Andrews in the fourth round, I'm okay with it for sure. But I would probably still prefer getting a wide receiver that has upside. If you're only starting two wide receivers, then I'm not opposed to grabbing Mark Andrews because he will give you a good positional value at the tight end position. He only ran on 48 or 41% of the snaps for the Ravens offense last year with Hayden Hurst gone. That's going to be a huge uptick in the percentage of playtime that he has. He had 10 touchdowns on 41% of the team snaps, which is just an absurd efficiency rate, absurd efficiency metric, which probably just means he's good at fucking football and he'll continue to do that, right? His regression is fucking everything's going to pull back. Disagree going to be really good again this year. So if you're only starting two wide receivers, then you don't really need depth at the position because you could still get a really solid wide receiver two in the sixth or seventh round. Mark Andrews, I'm okay with. Darren Waller is the only other mid-round tight end that I will be drafting. And I will talk about him in tomorrow's video. Bold predictions. I'm going to I'm gonna say something ignorant. I'm going to say something bold about my boy Darren Waller. So those are the only two like middle round guys I'm okay with, but only if they fall to you at value. I'm not going to go out of my way and target them because what we're going to do is wait till the end rounds, right? If you're in a one quarterback league, like that, that rounds 10 through 12 is going to be quarterbacks and tight end. I am very, very much in favor of double stacking two high upside tight ends. I think Chris Herndon has a really, really good shot to be the Darren Waller of this year. I think he's a super athletic guy that his quarterback loves. And they are void of weapons right now. Devoid of weapons right now. Denzel Mims hurt. Rashad Perriman hurt. Le'Veon Bell stinks. Frank Gore's fucking probably the best weapon that they have on that offense, to be honest with you. So I think Chris Herndon is going to smash this year. I know he was dealing with some kind of lung injury, but they said it wasn't serious. And he was back at practice the next day. So I ain't worried about it. Chris Herndon, TJ Hawkinson, Jonu Smith, Hayden Hurst. Like just double tap two of those guys in the 10th, 11th, 12th round. Jared Cook falls to you there. You smash the fuck out of that draft button on Jared Cook as well. Listen, there's going to be a couple breakouts each year at the tight end position. The guys that go late. It was Mark Andrews last year. It was Darren Waller last year. The year before that, it was George Kittle. Give yourself double the chance to hit on those guys because... Being able to get a guy that produces at that level, but drafting him in the 11th, 10th, 12th round compared to someone who had to draft him in the second, third, fourth round is going to give you such a big advantage at those other positions, at the wide receiver, at the running back position. So we double tap on the high upside tight ends later on in drafts. And that's how we do our drafts this year. That is the basic layout, fundamental brick by brick, click by click of a 2020 successful fantasy football draft. Speaking of click by click, if you scroll down and you found any valuable information in this video, please click the thing that looks like this. It's called the fucking thumbs up button. YouTube, 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 YouTube. Boy, I love YouTube. YouTube's unlocked a part of my life that 
I could never have fucking imagined being able to sit here and talk to, I don't know how many people are going to watch. It's probably like 14. Realistically, this video might go up to like 30 or 40,000 views pretty quickly because this is content season. All right. As soon as we hit the first week of September, it's go fucking time, man. Again, I just want to thank y'all for real, for real, for real, for real, for real, for anyone that has left a comment on a video, even the ones who leave the dislikes, man. I know that there, you, there's some fucking sad people out there that immediately just go onto videos and, and do the dislike. That shit keeps me hyped. That shit keeps me motivated. That shit keeps me working. Cause I'm like, I want you to hate me so much that you eventually, you know, people that hate you really are just, it's just life 101. Okay. People that dislike what you're doing, it's always a reflection of what they hate in themselves. They see me out here fucking being annoying and, and having a good time on camera. It's only because they wish that they had the courage to do it. They see me and they see what they wish they had done. Okay. And this is, sorry, I don't mean to be like an egotistical fucking asshole right now. I just meant a general sense of things. This is what happens in the internet world, man. And uh, for the most part, it's been completely positive engagement from you guys. And and really, really, I, I, I cannot like put into, as you can see, I'm stumbling and I'm muffling my words right now. I, I cannot put into a cohesive statement sentence how much uh, this summer and just the last summer and, and what we're doing and the support that you guys have given us has has meant to me um, as a person, as someone who is chasing their dreams, man, like I, I would not be able to do any of this without you guys believing in me. And I believe in y'all that you will smash your fantasy drafts just based on this video alone. If you take nothing away, if you don't buy the draft guide, which is like 38 times more intricate than what I just said, thanks to Monkey Knife Fight, you can get it for 10 bucks through there, promo code BDGE. But if you don't get it, like I still fuck with you guys so heavily for any of the support, any thumbs up, any comments, any tweets, any DMs, any emails, any fucking nudes that y'all send over. Don't do that. Don't fucking send a nude. But on some real shit, man, good luck in your fantasy drafts tonight if you still have them for the remainder of the week. I hope I was able to help you bring some light, some enlightenment, some enjoyment, some informational value, some entertainmental, enter entertaining value. I don't fucking know anymore. I'm at the end of this video and I'm starting to not make any sense, which is typically the case. So if you are new, subscribe to the channel if you want to continue hearing me say this fucking nonsense for the remainder of the year and prep for 2021 drafts next summer, baby, because we will be bike and better than ever. And, uh, and that's it. Those are my parting words. Good luck in your drafts. I have the utmost confidence that you will milk the tits out of your draft.